Good morning. Um, I'm Richard Campbell, and I'm a part of First Service Coffee, and this is an effort uh, that we're making to be able to share a little bit of our Christian education, our Sunday school um, program, and particularly in First Service Coffee, our endeavor to pursue the Apostles' Creed together. I think a wonderful um, effort being led by Joe Brown. Um, I am speaking to you from our library at my home, and um, while the background may look somewhat orderly, I am looking all around a room that was earlier the scene of a, I, I think it was the changing room for a fashion show. For those of you all who don't know, I have three adolescent daughters, and so when you're in a shutdown, in a quarantine, you find things to do. I think one of the things that they'll have to find to do is to clean this up later. But I'm here um, to talk with you as I was uh, supposed to do on March 15th um, about part of the Apostles' Creed. Um, and before I do that, let me just say it is an unusual time, isn't it? We're um, doing this because we can't congregate and meet together as a church, which is a sad thing. I hope we grieve that appropriately. And while it's great to be able to share things technologically like this and have a virtual Sunday school, it's not the same as being together with flesh and blood uh, believers. So we will lift that up to the Lord and trust his good providence for that. But I would say to you, enjoy the fellowship that you can with your family um, and uh, by phone and perhaps uh, FaceTime, uh, take advantage to have fellowship with other uh, believers in our church and your family across the miles. And certainly we need to be in prayer about the situation around us. It's unprecedented in um, really all of our lifetimes. I've been looking a little bit at the polio epidemics of the earlier 50s and the Spanish flu uh, epidemic in 1918. And those, I guess, compare in some ways, but in other ways, this is far different. But you know what it's not different from, um, and that is the pestilence and plagues that Scripture speaks of, because this is not new to the Lord. He has seen this on the face of the earth, and we need to take great encouragement that he is sovereign and is heaven, that he knows this coronavirus, he knows where it is going, where it has been, how it will um, end up. And we know the end of the story, as my wife is uh, fond of saying, and that is that Jesus gets the victory. So... I say that soberly and certainly with a prayerful heart that those who uh, are infected uh, will uh, experience healing. Certainly pray for protection in our congregation for you and your home. I pray that you will um, stay safe and uh, use good precautions and good sense. Um, but it's a difficult time and we'll acknowledge that together and uh, acknowledge it before the Lord and cry out to him. And I hope that your time of family worship your time of uh, corporate worship, however you're incorporating our church's uh, live stream of its services will be a blessing to you. Um, this is a little new to me. I've taught this way uh, for uh, some classes I've taught, but um, anyway, bear with me. I'm not, I'm not super technologically savvy. Let's, let's begin with prayer. Jesus, thank you for this chance to uh, talk a little bit about uh, the Apostles' Creed, and specifically the phrase in it, Lord, His only Son. Uh, Lord, we thank you that Jesus is your only Son, that He is your only Son, and that He is your Son. And so we pray that in the few moments we have here to think on that truth, that you would bless us. Please do protect us, safeguard our health, uh, be with our leaders. We pray for our country, our city, our state. We pray for the world, Lord. We pray that revival will come about because of, of the world uh, circumstances. And may your kingdom advance. May your people testify to the truth of your gospel. We pray in your name. Amen. So my sign phrase, as I just prayed, is his only son. Um, that is a part of the uh, Apostles' Creed. And this may seem a little corny, but I thought what we could do uh, as I begin, if I were with you, I would invite us to recite the creed together. Um, I think that in this time of quarantine, uh, it could also be something that you and your family might want to take on as a project to try and memorize, e either in whole or in part. Um, I think that is an endeavor that 
uh, Joe has for our church. You may be noticing that we are saying it more in uh, services in church. But anyway, let's say it together. I learned it in the old language, so uh, forgive me if um, if that throws you. And uh, uh, if you don't have it before you, why don't I just wait a second or you can press pause and grab either last week's bulletin um, or look it up on your phone real quick. Uh, although you might be watching this on your phone. At any rate, if you can't get a copy of it or you don't know it, um, perhaps just listen to me say it. And I'll probably mess up so you can see where I mess up. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day, he rose again from the dead and ascended into heaven, and is seated on the right hand of God the Father Almighty, from whence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurre resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. So please check me out and see if I, I, I uh, got it all right. Um, so we're talking this morning, or whenever you watch this, about uh, the phrase, His only Son. So I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only son, our Lord. Um, the overwhelming majority of space in the Apostles' Creed is actually devoted to Jesus. So this phrase is important because it deals with the central character, if you will, of the Creed. Um, the power and work of Jesus in the Apostles' Creed is central to what it's talking about, what we are professing. The gospel is really encapsulated in the Apostles' Creed. And so let me just move through the phrase. I don't think we'll, uh, this will take super long, but perhaps we can just consider this a devotional or a time to think on, on his only son. So first of all, his. Jesus is his son, his only son. Um, he belongs to the Father. Psalm 2-7 says, I will proclaim the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. So there in the Old Testament, the Lord is speaking to us through his word about Jesus belonging to him. Jesus is also begotten by the Father. And we know John 3, 16, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Begotten. Um, Begotten means, you know, to come from, to emanate from. Um, with Jesus, we need to be clear that this is not the same kind of uh, begetting that goes on in normal human reproduction and, and uh, childbearing and descendancy um, because um, Jesus is bound to the Father from the very beginning, isn't he? Um, we know that uh, in, the, in John 1.1, 1, 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was God, and the Word was with God. We know in the creation account, uh, you hear God say, let us make man in our own image. And I could certainly go into other places in the Old Testament where it's very clear that the second person of the Trinity, um, just like with Daniel's friends, is, seems to appear in the fiery furnace. Or uh, There are other accounts where we see... And it's mysterious because Jesus hasn't been born in space and time to Mary and Joseph, but that the second person of the Trinity is, exists. And of course, we believe in the Trinity and believe that from time immemorial, God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit has existed uh, in harmony and concert with one another. Um, Jesus is bound to his Father, so he belongs to his Father, he's begotten uh, from his Father, and he is bound to his Father. Um, I was thinking about the accounts in Matthew, um, not only when Jesus is baptized, but also at the transfiguration, when Jesus appears on the mount, um, the voice from heaven comes down, and what does it say? This is my Son, with him I am well pleased. Listen to him, he says at the Transfiguration. So God himself testifies, if you will, or attests or affirms that Jesus is bound to him and belongs to him. So Jesus 
is God's. Um, he is not his own agent. Um, this is mysterious for us, um, but there's this undeniable connection between Jesus the Son and God the Father. And uh, I guess I would conclude that part. John 10, 30 says, Jesus says, I and the Father are one. So he himself talks about the fact that he is um, inextricably tied to the Father. Jesus is God's only Son as well, right? Jesus alone is has God's divine nature. And I uh, mentioned John 1.1 1, 1 earlier. That tells us that the Word, um, who is Jesus, is God and was with God. And he was with God in the beginning, that, that passage says. Uh, at the beginning of the book of Hebrews, um, we have the passage, In these last days, Hebrews 1.2, He has spoken to us by his Son, whom he appointed heir of all things, and through whom also he made the universe. Again, pointing to the fact that he made the universe, Jesus was there. The sun is the radiance of God's glory and the exact representation of his being. So Jesus exactly represents God. So we get a full picture of who Jesus is, I mean who God is, through Jesus, right? And this is backed up by the people who saw Jesus, who lived with Jesus. We have Nathaniel's account in John 1.49 where he says, Rabbi, you are the Son of God. We have Martha in John 11 say, I believe that you are the Messiah, the Son of God. She says that to Jesus. So these are people who are living with Jesus and are attesting in God's word for us now 2,000 years later to the fact that they saw him and they declared, yes, this man is in fact God. Um, and of course, Jesus said that about himself. In John eight fifty eight. he said um, to the Pharisees, before Abraham was, I am. So Jesus is God's only perfect, true son. Um, we could talk about this a little bit in terms of um, if you... Uh, have a son or you are a son as I am a son. I don't have a son, but I am a son. Um, I am definitely my father's son. And those of you who know, who may know my father, um, I, I resemble him greatly. Um, and he resembled his father greatly and I resembled his father greatly. And so there's a, a very striking, strong family resemblance. Not that that always happens, but it is an earthly picture for us sometimes of how um, I am in some ways a representation of my father, but the analogy breaks down, doesn't it? Because I'm not my father. I'm a separate person. Um, I came into being at a particular point in time, and there was a time in which I didn't uh, exist, and my father did. All those things are different from Jesus and the father. Um, also, there are some different references in scripture to individuals or beings being the sons of God, which are not the same as Jesus. They are not the true, perfect son of God. So angels are referred to as sons of God. But in Hebrews, where we just read uh, in chapter one, later in that passage, it talks about Jesus being superior to the angels. And believers are often referred to as sons of God. Um, but we're sons of God by adoption, aren't we? We become sons of God, not because we were made by God, but because we have been uh, through uh, Jesus' atoning work adopted and grafted into relationship with him because of God's work. So just to be clear, Jesus is God's only true son and, and perfect son. Um, God is love and love must have an object. And so from eternity, he, his, the object of God the Father's love has been his son. And so um, he has always been with him and shared his glory with him. And Jesus has always been the perfect representation and um, radiance of, uh, um, of God the Father. Um, probably most powerfully, God has demonstrated Jesus is his son by raising him from the dead. Um, by raising him from the dead, he has demonstrated that he, unlike angels, unlike us, um, uh, is different and is, is uh, God himself. And finally, um, because Jesus is God's only son, 
Um, he is our door to God, isn't he? John 14, 16, Jesus tells us, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No man comes to the Father but by me. And um, this I would just like for us to sort of close with. Um, you know, this is probably one of the harder things as a Christian in the 21st century to, uh, if not embrace, profess. Um, certainly, you've had water cooler conversations or late night chats or some sort of dialogue with someone or else you've witnessed it where someone says, I think that's great for you, but I have my own God. I have my own truth is the way it's usually expressed nowadays. Um, so the idea that someone would have an exclusive claim uh, on uh, the way to God is very much attacked by the culture. Um, that grates on our culture's pluralistic and relativistic tendencies. And um, as R.C. Sproul has said, we as a, as a culture, and probably particularly as Americans, have an antipathy and an allergy to anything that's exclusive. And this is more and more true as tolerance um, and um, diversity have been elevated as virtues um, rather than the byproducts of um, holiness. Um, and so we find that the, the idea of there being one way and other ways being wrong to be very, very um, challenging to express in a loving way. Um, but I think to encourage you, this is true, not because it's my way and not because it's your way as a Christian, but because it's God's way. If someone challenges you with this, Perhaps one of the most helpful things you can say to them is, you know, I didn't make that up. I agree with you. That is hard. And it's not something that I can pretend to necessarily explain to you. But Jesus said it. And so I would encourage us to wrestle with the fact that Jesus said it versus my believing it. Uh, and then that would hopefully shift the conversation to, well, who did Jesus say he was? Um, so God says it. And and we know he's confirmed it through his son. And frankly, if Jesus isn't the way, then he's not anyway, right? Because he claimed to be that. And so if he's not that, then what else of his claims do you really buy? Um, now, probably a follow-on conversation in that pretend conversation you might have with a, a skeptic or an unbeliever but something we can certainly remind ourselves of is that, you know, God was not required to give us any way, right? When we were fallen in our sin, there was not necessarily any guarantee that he um, would provide uh, and had provided um, a way uh, for us to have a, a sonship relationship with him. And yet he did. And so maybe the question is wrong. Maybe it's not, how can you say that's the only way, but rather, how could there be a way? What a good God he is to make a way to himself. Um, you know, there's no atonement uh, offered or presented by Buddha or Muhammad. Only Jesus atones. Um, and only Jesus really changes hearts. He's not just a great man that we believe in. He's a living God who uh, works uh, mysteriously in his sovereignty to prick our hearts, to draw us to himself, to cause us to repent of our sin and be changed. And we need to take heart in that. And that's what I think we need to point um, our unbelieving friends and family to, the fact that he is exclusive, but what he does is also exclusive because no other uh, faith and no other God promises the kinds of things that our good God does. Um, we live in a culture that's very similar to Rome. Rome, uh, at the time of Acts, was quite happy for you to add your God to the list of all the other gods. Uh, it was when the Christians began to make it clear uh, that what we're talking about was the case, that there is only one way to God, and that is by Jesus, um, that they began to be persecuted. Um, so I, I, I want to um, remind us that it is a good thing that Jesus is the way, the truth, and the life. Um, the attributes of God, the names of God in, the, in Scripture, the works and activities that belong to uh, only God are all found in Jesus, his only Son. 
And um, don't forget that those first century disciples, particularly the Jewish ones, who had been brought up in a religion that taught them that there was only one God and you were not to worship any other God, they fell down on their feet and worshiped Jesus Christ. Remind yourself of that. They must have been convinced, convinced and convicted that he, in fact, was the Messiah. He was the only true God. And they, they did that. And it's documented they did that. And you can too. And I invite you um, in this odd time that we're, we are living in um, to challenge yourself. Do we, uh, do we act? Do we live in such a way that we would profess with our actions and with our words and with our thoughts that Jesus is God's only son? Thanks for bearing with me. I feel like all I did was just outline some Bible verses, and I hope even that is a help. Um, I am praying for you now, and um, I pray that uh, the Lord will bless you through this. Jesus, thank you for this time in your word, thinking on your truths. We thank you that you are God's only son, and we thank you that we have a way to you, that you are the way, the truth, and the life. We will praise you for that, and even in the ways that are mysterious about it, and that we can't understand, and that in our particular time and place and culture, it's hard to sometimes declare and profess that, Lord. We will still praise you for it and ask you to help us um, better uh, understand it, more importantly, better to embrace it, and, and probably most importantly, to trust you in it. We thank you for that, Lord, and we again lift up the circumstances of our world to you this day. We pray in your name. Amen.